um, do me a favor. I want to make sure that I remember who you are. So put your name and uh, your company name and core competency in the chat. Let me know and let buyers know and let other people in the community know who you are. Um, if you don't know who I am, I've spent 20 years in the federal government space as a small business owner. And since 2018, I've been teaching people like you that government contracting is not a secret. It's just a process. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the process for shaping questions and why it's so important to plan every meeting that you have. And in, in this particular case, the part of the meeting I want to talk about and teach you about are the questions that we're uh, dealing with. So I'm going to share slides today for any of you who've been to other trainings. Many times I just talk straight to you, but today I got a lot of slides. I want to, not a lot of slides, but a lot of information I want to go through. I'm going to talk fast because I, I have a lot I want to share. It's easily a day's worth of training I'm trying to put into 30 minutes here. So uh, bear with me and um, again, ask questions as, uh, as we go along and I can follow up later. So before I get too far into the questions itself, one of the things I want to talk about are um, you know what you should be thinking about ahead of time. So one is this idea that uh, there's a myth out there that buyers like to talk about themselves. You know, we say two ears, one mouth, get them to talk. Well, that's not totally true. What buyers like to do is to talk about their needs and um, talk about it in a way that they might find out whether you're the right uh, solution or product to fit their needs. And so um, they're not really looking to talk about golf and all these uh, you know, random personal things, or they're, they're also not looking to talk about things you could have looked up on the internet. So we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, so keep this in mind when we're talking about buyers, uh, we want to make sure we're engaging them in a way they feel like they're getting value out of meeting with you, even though it's your request for the meeting. So here's some things not to ask uh, when you're in there. And I just alluded to this, right? Anything you can find on the internet, facts on the internet, um, you know, you want to know how many users uh, an, an agency has or how big a facility is. A lot of these things are online. And so you want to go do the research. Same thing if you're calling a contracting officer or a small business specialist, they often uh, will say back to people calling them, hey, have you looked in SAM? We put that out in SAM. And so before you make phone calls into buyers, make sure you're looking on the internet, make sure you're looking on SAM for those basic facts. And then also there's information on their website, right? This is a little bit more than what you might see on the internet, and even though they're the same thing, right? But going into their uh, website, you might find a strategic plan. Uh, you might find uh, a document that defines uh, how to do business within an agency and here's what we buy. Well, if they put that document together, they're doing it so that we read it before we talk to them. That way, uh, and it's really important when you go in, you're able to reference this homework you did. And so don't ask about information that you could easily find. I don't mean that it could be on the internet, it's a little harder, but I mean the stuff that's really basic, like underneath how to do business with the Navy, right? That kind of stuff uh, frustrates a buyer. Um, Okay, and the last thing I want to talk about is I'm going to be introducing you to how to ask questions. I'm following a model called spin selling, um, and it's just a way of asking questions. But it's really important to understand the difference between a talent and a skill because uh, talents are what we don't necessarily need to practice. We just have them. And um, as we move forward in business development or capture, we might use our talents to have some levels of success, right? We're able to maybe engage people. But a skill is something we learn and then develop through practice uh, over and over until we get so experienced at it that we're doing it without thinking about it. And that's what I want to talk to you about today is skills uh, or our skills um, in selling. It is not a talent. Certain talents can make you a, uh, you know, make selling easier for you. I wouldn't even say it makes you a better salesperson. I would say it might make it easier for you. So, for example, if, if like me, you like to talk, well, that makes it easier, right? So if you're. Um, but if you don't like to talk, you can have just as much success as I can. You just have to compensate it uh, with some skills. Um, and, and when I add skills in there as well, I get better. And so skills are this understanding of the how. Um, how do I need to do something? A lot of people tell us what. Um, what is maybe the name of the skill? And, and, and as you begin to learn that skill, you're learning the how and then you implement it. And I talk about this already. Skills need to be practiced over and over. You're kind of developing a habit or you're ingraining it into your, um, your muscle memory, if you will. Um, so an example of asking questions, you want to be able to get used to this idea of asking questions in a certain way. So let me talk about what that way is. Um, so I said spin selling and spin selling stands for situation, problem, implication and need payoff. Let me explain what those mean, those four um, type of questions. 
So situational questions, situation questions are factual, right? I talked about going to the internet. This is where you go to get your situation questions answered. Uh, it's, it's in particular now, in the old days, you still had to do your research, but it was a lot harder. Now it's very easy to do research on most basic situational questions around um, facts, how many users do you have, or current situations even, because they'll put out an annual report that might talk about what they accomplished last year, an agency did, or the challenges or what they hope to accomplish last year that they didn't. You could look at an annual report and get an understanding of their current situation. Um, and then the, the way you know that a question is a situation question, another way of thinking about this is it's mostly benefiting you, not the buyer. Right. So if you're just actual ask, asking factual questions, they're just giving you factual answers, but their their life is not any better. As we move forward into problem questions, these begin to be more about the buyer and helping them truly understand the problem and, and the impact, et cetera, to the problem that we'll explore here. So problem questions um, are about obviously problems. Right. Here are problems I have or uh, and, and problems are um, flat out. This is an issue or difficulties, we struggle to do this, or dissatisfaction, I'm dissatisfied with the incumbent, or I'm dissatisfied with all of our, the agency, the vendors approach to something, and I need a different way of looking at this. Um, it doesn't mean that the current vendor couldn't do it, but maybe it's not in the, even in their scope to look at the next level. So problems, difficulties, or dissatisfactions are three unique things. And as you begin to create problem questions, you would try to uh, line them up against those three things. So um, I wrote here that it's the single most important skill to learn because many of us will go in and ask all sorts of situation questions. Uh, we'll chat in the wrong direction, but we're, uh, we, we don't have the skills to develop the problems with the customer. And it's really important for us to do this because we're trying to get them to tell us about an implied problem or an ex uh, and that allows us to lead to an explicit problem. And I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, but Stephen Covey talks about it in this way, where he says, seek first to understand, then to be understood. And the important thing here is you don't want to come in and go, I know my solution solves this problem. And I'm just going to tell them about my solution because I once they hear it, they're going to love it. That's not the way sales works. Sales is you need to bring the buyer up to your speed. And so you need to help them understand the problem. And it begins with asking these problem questions and having dialogue um, around that. The next questions, set of questions are implication questions. And in here, um, if the problem questions are about a problem, the implication questions are about, well, what is the effect of this problem? Who else will it impact? And so in here, you're going to discuss the consequences of the problem. And this is where you're taking something from an implied, I kind of have this problem, you know, yeah, I get it. It's a little difficult to explicit. I have this problem. I need to solve it. If we don't solve it, it's going to cost this much or it's going to impact us this much. And that's why I'm saying we want to explore the effects of the problem. What what is it um, impacting with them and maybe broader other departments, et cetera? Um, when you ask implication questions, it's linking the seriousness of the problem that you've been building um, up to this price that you might have on your product or service. And so if I'm coming in and I'm saying, hey, it's going to be a $15 million price tag, then I need to build up $15 million of problems in their mind uh, before they see that, right? And, 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 and that's a big thing. But like I worked on a recent project that's uh, cybersecurity and it's about um, doing threat analysis and um, continuous authority to operate type stuff. And in there, the idea is you just keep building up the, the, the um, implications of not doing cybersecurity correctly, for example, so they see it. And at some point, I've said this before, right, is that if people are looking at the price, I haven't built the value. If I haven't built the value, right, I want to avoid them talking about the price, then I need to go back and keep exploring the problem with them. What's the implication of that problem? The last thing um, I talked about here already with the uh, helping them build that pain up so powerfully that they buy. So I describe it as people buy when the pain is bigger than the price. I need to get them to feel the, the severity of the problem that they have. And, uh, and when they do, they will invest anything it takes to solve that problem within reason, right? The ROI, the return on investment needs to be there. Okay, so the next uh, last set of questions here on spin are need payoff. We, we walk them through the problem and what's the implication of those problems? Where else are those problems impacting your agency? Now we're trying to bring them back to the solution. 
And so here um, we focus it on the product or solution you're selling, but we do it in a way that we're trying to get them to say what the benefits are of your solution. Uh, I, I wrote here that it mirrors the implication question. So I might ask a question um, about the problem in, in an implication, or I might talk about the benefit. I might ask a question about how would this benefit you um, and turn it into a need payoff question. So how else is this impacting you or how could this benefit you is where I'm taking the exact same question and going from implication to need payoff. So getting them to see the benefits of the solution um, uh, by by answering their own questions. Well, we I would benefit from this. Um, and, and that's what I'm saying in that last bullet, right? Let the buyers think and tell the benefits. Um, they will know where your solution fits and how it can help. Your job is to just get them to that stage. You're really guiding them to that stage. You're not trying to sell them. You're trying to get them set, them to sell themselves, if that makes sense. They have to see the serious stuff, seriousness of the problem and then they have to realize that this is the solution they need. And then they look over and go, oh, my gosh, you sell that solution, don't you? We sure do. Um, but you have to guide them there because you know the problem. You know the solution. You've done it all, but they haven't had as much time to think about it. So let's dive into these. I've got four slides that I want to go through, and I'm just looking at my time trying to balance it. Um, four questions or four sets of questions. And I'm going to start with situation questions. I want to give you three examples in each. And the idea is they're kind of building up on each other. Um, so you see how I'm working them forward. I wanna give you a particular scenario that I'm thinking about is I'm imagining that I'm a SharePoint company and I'm trying to go into an agency to um, sell them SharePoint uh, services in general, like migration, et cetera. But I also have a product that's a knowledge-based product that I think would really benefit them that has benefited other customers of mine. So I'm gonna shape some questions around there to guide them to this point where my solution is the answer to their problems. I just have to get them to see the problems. So I'm gonna walk through this uh, scenario. So in this particular one, I like starting off uh, uh, meetings when I have them with some situational questions. I told you that you wanna do all the research ahead of time. Those are factual things. You wanna um, get as much as you can. But when you go into a meeting, you don't want to you don't want to dive right into problem questions and make them just feel bad. It's like I'm instantly in there ripping a Band-Aid off and oh, the pain's powerful. Right. I want to guide them to the problem questions for the, in the first few minutes. And I can do that with some low level situational questions. If I can think of ones like the one I'm about to talk about, uh, then I can use those. If I can't think of another situational question, I'll ask a situational question that I'll, I already know the answer. Right. And I'll try to lead them to that um, phase. So in this particular case, I really like talking about uh, I was doing my homework on your current situation. And can I briefly share what I learned to confirm that I have it right? I'm telling them right here in this question that I've done my homework and they're going to appreciate the fact I've done my homework. And what else can they say when I ask, can I confirm that I have it right? And then I'll go through saying a couple of things that, you know, I looked, you guys are on this version of SharePoint, you have this many users. Um, it looks like SharePoint is used pretty heavily here, but you also have some people over on Salesforce. Did I get that about right? Uh, yeah, you did. And, and here I'm trying to basically let them know that I've done my homework and also begin to lead towards those uh, problem questions. So here I might say, you know, I, uh, I was able to see some articles or something that said you were on SharePoint 2013 or SharePoint 2016 or whatever. Um, uh, what, what other versions are you using throughout your command? So if I'm looking at the Navy, uh, you know, they might have a different set of uh, users on SharePoint Online here. And over here, they got them on SharePoint 2013, let's say. So different versions. So I'm trying to ask them some questions that there's no way I could have researched it on my own. Um, so, but it is just a factual question. It doesn't benefit them at all. They go this, this, this. Great. Thank you. And then the last question I have on situation as an example here is, um, do you have a count of business critical or mission critical applications on SharePoint? And what I'm trying to get to here is now I'm beginning a transition into problem questions. In my mind, when I'm preparing these questions, now I'm beginning this transition because it's a pretty much yes or no question, but it's a very heavy Yes or no, because first off, I'm asking them, do you have a count of all applications on SharePoint? And there are thousands in any kind of normal environment. And then what I'm saying is, do you have a count of the business critical apps? 
Uh, I have a customer that I know ha they have a mission critical app because I built it on SharePoint when I was working with them. And that thing is a mission critical app that maybe their IT department is not totally tracking. And so that's the problem I'm trying to get them to recognize is that you've got these critical apps that if it goes down, then then uh, the the uh, sales, federal sales side of the house will be impacted. They might miss a proposal. That's a huge, huge deal. Right. And so that means these people need to be aware of it. How can they be aware of it unless somebody lets them know it's pretty impossible. But my solution or my services helps these people who I'm trying to meet with create an inventory, like go out and crawl and find them and bring them back, whatever it is. So uh, I don't want to get too far into the weeds of the tech, but these questions have led me into the next round of problem questions that I want to get into. So in problem questions now, I'm, I want to begin to get them to explore it. I alluded to it in the situational question, the last one. Now I'm saying, um, I was reading a document, for example, that talks about uh, you guys have planned to migrate all the way up onto SharePoint Online, which is the cloud, if you're not familiar, um, but migrate Microsoft SharePoint to the cloud. And I, I see from their report from last year that they didn't get it done. They got it 50% done and they're planning on, you know, actually extending it another two years or something. And so I want to start digging into that problem because I think I can help in there and I have to get them talking about the problem. So what prevented you from migrating to SharePoint Online last year? Can you kind of you know, I read this report, but can you expand on that a little bit? What did you guys run into? Was it just time or resources or was it actually maybe complexity? And, and, and so I've expanded on that question because I know SharePoint, right? So if you're speaking to your core competency, you should be able to have a question like this and expand if you need to with a couple of words. But that's a good question to get them start talking about the challenges they might be facing with migrating uh, SharePoint online. This next question is how satisfied are users with the value of SharePoint to their mission. This one's really important to me because as a SharePoint company, we develop uh, mission critical or business critical solutions for people who were not in the IT, IT department, but all around the agency. And so I'm curious, um, do people, like I've been in some organizations, the Air Force uh, a while ago, so hopefully they fixed it, where SharePoint was just considered a, a completely unreliable tool. Everybody knew it could do stuff, but it was uh, slow as molasses, very slow. And so it just um, impacted people's mission negatively. I can't use your tool for my mission because it slows me down. So uh, I know that the people I'm talking to probably have an idea of how people feel about their, their um, enterprise systems. This enterprise system is called SharePoint. I'm going to explore that with this question. Uh, the next question here. Uh, um, is, so I'll just read it first and then I'll expand on it, right? Um, I'm, this question I'm feeding into, I'm already preparing myself to understand what I want to say. A lot of agencies struggle with the loss of institutional knowledge as older workforce retires, older um, staff retire. What tools and processes do you have in place to capture their knowledge? And um, so in here, the reason I'm asking this question is because I sell a knowledge management tool. You remember at the beginning in my scenario, I said, I have this knowledge management tool that I've used with other agencies or, or commercial customers, and it's great. Um, and one of, its, one of the things it does is this transfer of institutional knowledge. All this 20 or 30 years of, of experience a person has, we get them to put it in this knowledge management system. And uh, then when they leave, the institution still has the bulk of their knowledge. And so I know that that's a great solution and it can help them. I got to get them to see that as an even problem. And in the government, this is a big deal. We do have a retiring workforce, um, that especially in acquisition. So there's a lot of people leaving who have a lot of knowledge. What are we doing to capture that? And this is what I'm trying to do with this problem question is get them to say, you know, we have a process out there that is, uh, you know, let's uh, the last last month of their um, time, you know, when we know they're going to retire last month of their time uh, in agency, you know, we meet with them and ask them to document things. Well, this will lead me to a whole bunch of other questions. I'm not doing them today, but it'll lead me to a whole bunch of other questions that begin to get them to see you should be having them document it for a year, at least like kind of on a regular basis. And you'll see me talk about that in a little bit. But these problem questions are designing designed to get them to start thinking about the problems they have. So I asked them those problem questions. Now I'm going to go into trying to um, really what are the effects of the, uh, the problems we just talked about, right? What's the impact throughout the entire agency? 
I want to take that soft pain, make it a painful pain or a hard pain. I want to take that implied need and make it an explicit need. And so I'm, I'm moving forward here with implication questions. And the first one, going back to our migration thing is, you know, OK, John, so how has the delay or long migration schedule impacted the users? Right. I get that you guys are the IT department and you had to extend your schedule by a year. Um, you know, what's what's the impact to the users? And, and in no political way, but if you're paying attention to the news, the Secret Service just had this problem with migrating from cell phones, old cell phones to new cell phones. And in that process, they lost stuff, right? And in there, what we're trying, what I'm trying to do is right there. That's a great example of going, how has it impacted other people? And that's the pain I want to bring, right? So bring that to any other agency. Um, I can uh, exp explore that effect of the problem of a migration schedule being stretched out. Um, now the people who thought they were going to be on SharePoint online are on the older version with less functionality. And because it has less functionality and it's an older version, there's a moratorium, a cutoff of any new development. So these people who are still on the old version can't get anything developed now. They have to wait till they're on the next version. And so this, this impact is what I want to get this person who I'm talking to to think about. I want them to understand that the pain isn't just theirs in, let's say, the IT department. But the pain is throughout the entire agency. And frankly, the pain is on them when all these people are complaining to them and their staff or something, right? So the next uh, question I have here going with uh, those apps that I talked about, right? Um, I asked whether you have a list. They, they don't. Um, and there's tons of people out there. And so here I'm saying, well, if you don't, uh, if you don't really have an accurate list, what concerns do you have? Um, with not having an accurate list of homegrown mission critical applications. Are you concerned about outages impacting people where if they had just told you, you could have been protecting it? Um, I Because I know that's a, an actual thing, I will be creating implications around that to lead them to that pain, right? I would break that up into five, six, seven questions that are designed to kind of expand on that. Um, you know, what are you doing right now to... Uh, to try to address that problem. But here I'm saying, what concerns do you have with not having it? I want them to see this concern of if I don't have the homegrown apps on my radar, then when I have an outage here, it could negatively impact the entire mission of our agency. And, and these missions are hugely critical, right? Whether it's DOD and, and warfare, whether it's the VA and healthcare, right? Taking care of patients who are right there in the hospital. These are important missions these agencies have. I need to get those people in the IT department who are responsible for SharePoint to see it all the way out. And when I do, I'm building that problem up to a much bigger level that my solution is the, is the one for them, or at least a solution at this level. And then I come in and compete in the federal space. Um, the last question I have for implications is, uh, how will the loss of institutional knowledge impact the department and re remaining staff? And here, so I'm trying to say, what's the effect of not capturing that institutional knowledge? You've admitted that you really don't have a tool in place and the process is pretty um, basic at the very end of their time with the agency, but how would it impact the department or remaining staff? In particular, I might be driving towards um, acquisition, right? I might lead them to thinking about the acquisition department or the HR department. What happens when these people leave and there's all this knowledge they have built up and it's just gone? And so for acquisition in the federal government, what's happening is we have a lot of junior, let's call them uh, seven years or less, five years or less, contracting officers who just don't have those years of experience and, and the number of contracts they've processed to, to, um, to really see all the lessons. But these guys could have easily have documented it. So I want to get them thinking about, well, um, you know, shoot, we might be awarding contracts that are the higher protest level goes up, et cetera. And I see I'm pretty tight on time. So let me go through this last slide here. Um, so this last one is how much will be saved annually when you uh, fully migrate SharePoint to the cloud? So I'm transitioning off of the problem and the implication. I want them to start thinking of the benefits. And um, so in this particular case, the problems are all these people who might not be on the cloud and all that stuff, but those are just problems. But they also have a, a huge cost of supporting different versions of SharePoint. If you're on one version now, all your people are trained for that one version. Uh, actually, the cloud costs go down because you don't have to have servers or data centers. So there's all these things. 
I want them to think about that as well, going, well, shoot, every day that we're not migrated fully over to the cloud is costing us $10,000 or something, right? Some number that they begin to put in their head. Uh, until we ask, sometimes they're not even thinking about it. Uh, what could you do with an accurate list of homegrown applications, right? If, if, if right now, John, you had a list of every single mission critical or business critical app out there, what would you do with that? Like what, what would change in your process? How would it benefit uh, other departments if, if everybody had a definitive list? And then I'd let them kind of expand on it. I don't need to tell them the benefits. I need to guide them to tell me the benefits. Um, and many of those benefits will be exactly what I say. And if I'm lucky, some of them will be ones I hadn't even thought of that our product could solve. The last one is uh, sometimes there's a loss of institutional knowledge during vendor transition. So I talked about retiring employees, but what about when a contract after five years is expiring and a new vendor is gonna be awarded? Um, how could retaining the knowledge there help the agency? I know we have transition periods. That's like kind of forcing people to work at the last minute. But what if there was a way that that institutional knowledge was documented? Oh, well, shoot, that would probably make the ramp up period higher. We'd have a whole lot less issues with the new vendor, whatever, right? I'm trying to get them to think about that. Um, so if you've uh, been to my training before, you know that I like to sit there and end on time. So I'm almost out of time and I want to come back to this. If it made sense what I was talking about, write spin in the, um, in the chat. Just tell me spin makes sense, right? I gave you a day's worth of training inside of a 30 minute window. This set of questions come from a call plan that I prepare when I go into meetings. If you'd like a copy of the call plan template and you don't have it already, put a comment into the uh, chat and I'll be happy to send that to you. Um, it's really important to me that more of us learn how to succeed in federal government sales because uh, you know, when you succeed, I think everybody succeeds. The last thing is, um, if you think other people would value this training I'm doing, tag them, either tag them right now in comments or, or tag them in LinkedIn somewhere and invite them back to this uh, training. I think the more people we have in our community, the more of you I see working together and finding potential teammates or just networking in general for whatever benefit comes from that. Remember, government contracting, it is not a secret. It's just a process.